I love doing this. This was never something I was seeking out to do. It's not more important for me to work with people that I don't like and respect than it is to be in wrestling media. It's so much more important to me. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Trash, and stand back for another interview. This time, I'm joined by the one and only, Kat Elizabeth from Fightful. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so nice to finally get in here. I've been very busy, but once I was kind of resuming other appearances, this was absolutely at the top of my list. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I am really excited to chat with you, and that makes me very, very happy to hear that you're as excited as I am. So if we take this back, Kate, where do you first discover wrestling? As a fan. So I, as a fan, discovered it a lot later than most people do. I discovered it when I was about 20, 21 years old through an ex-boyfriend. I always say that keeping pro wrestling, getting rid of him, like both great decisions for <laughs> me, both the right directions to go with my life at that time. But um, he was a fan and we were just kind of clicking around and Raw was on and I kind of liked it. And I had friends who had been watching it for a while um, and then one of those friends invited me over for the Royal Rumble pay-per-view because he found out I started like kind of watching it. Um, and that was in 2009. And the first thing I could kind of remember like keeping me in as a fan, like that made me a fan was definitely um, Legacy with Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase. That was like the first thing that grabbed me. So I sadly have my ex to thank for getting me into wrestling. But the, the story that kind of kept my interest was definitely Randy Orton and, and Legacy. When you go back and watch that story now, do you have like mixed emotions because you're like, I like this story, but the person that got me into it is like, Ooh. do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's interesting because it feels like there was so much that they could have done with that stable. Like it, it oh, feels definitely. so, so much like they left so much juice on the like table. I feel like that could be an episode in itself. Oh, uh, its own podcast, its own series, because, yeah. um, and that's not even a slight of anything, just, um, it, wrestling's incredibly difficult to book sometimes, so, mm. but that was, um, when I go back and watch it, there's a few things that I, I realize that it's one that, like, I understand why Randy Orton was the first guy that got me into it, like, mm. um, that mystique, the way he would cheat, like, when you're watching for the first time, I feel as though, like, the first time those heels are cheating in the way that they do, you're like, you can't do that. Like why it, the ref doesn't even see like, you have all of these very authentic reactions and R Randy Orton's just phenomenal at playing into those at that time. But it is mixed emotions because um, now as a, a bit of a smarter fan, you realize what they could have done and what that could have become. Obviously. I mean, it's, it's so funny to think about that and looking at Cody Rhodes now, right? Like what, Definitely. what ended up happening, what ended up happening there for sure. So um, it's definitely funny to to kind of go back and, and look through the lens of that. Mm. You brought up there, obviously, getting into wrestling in 2009. So what I am curious to know at this point, and you talk about being a smarter fan there, what about when you go back and watch stuff from, say, previous eras, whether it be the ruthless aggression, the uh, attitude, etc. Can you watch that as just a fan or does your smarter, brain, or your smarter fan brain in your own words kick in when you're watching that stuff i would say it's actually it, it's a really nice melding of both one thing that's almost an advantage of watching from like 2009 on is um with any art form i'm a big believer of watching what came before it so um there's not a ton in the attitude era that i love like i think a lot of it doesn't hold up but like i am someone that when I go back and watch like mid 80s nwa or or i'm now kind of getting like very into New Japan and all Japan a little bit. A lot of um, Rogue Eddie Kingston tweets with random links to thank for that. He'll just tweet out a match that I should watch. And, <laughs> and then I have to know, right? But um, I, I view wrestling as an art form. It's, I think, the most unique form of storytelling. And I, I don't just assume that whatever's on now is the best of what's out there in the same way that I don't think the best music is necessarily what's on the radio. Like, I'll go back and listen to the clash and pink floyd and the beatles and everything in between Ooh. because i i think it makes it so much more inspired to watch it through a current lens so i think i do view things through a smarter lens but it it's it makes me have such an appreciation for it 
when I go back and I see Bret Hart and Owen Hart or Eddie and, and Ray at Halloween Havoc, like, oh my oh, gosh. So match. yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. when you you stumble into those that I also have a, a bigger appreciation for what's happening in, in wrestling today because I, I do try to go back and, and learn from eras that came before me. It's just um increasingly difficult with how healthy and robust the current wrestling landscape is yeah Uh, because my 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 time is more limited than it used to be but some of my favorite stuff is to just go down rabbit holes because i'm not reviewing it or i'm not um predicting where stories are gonna go because they're wrapped i can kind of just sit in the moment and and appreciate the matches for what they are Mm. you brought up there uh obviously some areas of wrestling that you love and the fact that one of your favorite things is to go back and watch older stuff what era would you say that you've missed out on? Because I know you said you're not the biggest fan of the Attitude Era. What era that maybe you've gone back and watched and you're like, oh, I wish I was a fan during this point. I missed out. Yeah. Um, each one kind of has like their own imprint, doesn't it? It's it's funny. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like watching Bret Hart and his prime would, for me as a fan, be paramount to pretty much anything but if i'm picking like a promotion at a time probably mid 80s nwa is is where like my heart is most connected to i would say (laughs) Mm, that's really cool is there any reason for that uh i think my favorite thing about wrestling is just always been in-ring storytelling like i i gravitate to that i think it's the most proprietary thing about wrestling and i I love promos and I love the athleticism, but watching just clean in-ring storytelling unfold is my absolute favorite part about wrestling. And I feel like that was the sweet spot of of that style a little bit was that um, mm. all of the the consequences were, were happening in the ring. And um, that's the thing I just, I feel most connected to in pro wrestling, I'd say. Mm. I understand completely what you're saying there. Cause I think I'm on a similar wavelength to you, if I'm being totally honest, but as we move on in the conversation, like, how do you get into this crazy world of wrestling content creating? Because <laughs> you talk about how busy you are and things like that. How do you become so busy, etc.? Um, Through a series of, of really blessed people in my life, um, I had always had an interest in radio i went to college initially to be a sports broadcaster on the the baseball side um i i love i still love baseball so much and i really wanted to go into to commentary but as i was in college i discovered that public relations fit more with my skill set and so i i went in that route instead um but I'd always loved radio. I had an incredible experience. The college that I went to had a, a top 10 college radio station called WSOU. And I learned a tremendous amount about that world and still loved it. Um, and then it was kind of just like kicking around in my my ether for a long time as my life progressed. And then um, I, by happenstance, got a, a ticket through a friend named Kevin Gill, who I adore. He does commentary for oh, GCW. I love that Great guy. Dude. He's, he is um, unintentionally like a little bit of my wrestling guardian angel. It's so funny. He is someone that I give a lot of credit to because I had just kind of gotten into wrestling through WWE. I didn't really know anything about other promotions yet at all, but I went to um wrestlecon which in america is big wrestling convention that piggybacks off the weekend of wrestlemania Mm. um and i had known kevin actually through music we had worked together through uh, a band that he was working with i had done publicity for and he was at wrestlecon and he kind of introduced me to um to a world outside of it and he was so warm and inviting with the way that he spoke about it not very gatekeepery I, i think that could be really intimidating especially like it was like one in the morning. I'm a woman in this convention hall watching wrestling. Like I, I it was so out of my comfort zone. Um, but he he was, just has the warmest heart and the most inviting persona about it. Um, and and so I I went to that, and through him, I actually met my friends who run a podcast called The Shining Wizards, and I started doing like a couple of sit-in appearances with them. They're great friends of mine. I'm I'm so thankful for them in my life, but when the pandemic happened and everything shut down, uh, we decided to do AEW content as bonus content. So 
Uh, that podcast is still going. It's called The Mark Order. Mm. <laughs> we have a blast every Wednesday. I'm sure we'll be doing our collision show as well. But it was really just kind of started as bonus content for for that show. They're also talking about loving to go back and learn. Like they're all three hosts on that are encyclopedias of knowledge. So if I'm ever like, I need a rabbit hole to go down. It's usually Matt over there who's like, go look at Gary Albright matches. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. Um, mm. But in, in Mark Order... We started, that was the first time I, I was consistently putting out wrestling content. And then um, I just started having some really fun and positive interactions with with Sean at Fightful. I would kind of be just watching and, and super chatting a little bit and um, maintaining a relationship with him, you know, just just because he seemed like a cool dude uh, over social media. And he invited me on for a prediction show. And I say that was like my my fightful dark match because we had a, a really good time doing it. And then uh, a couple months later, the wonderful, incredible um, headline god Jeremy Lambert decided he wanted to vacate the Friday show, and um, that was kind of it. I got I got asked to step up and do that. And then shortly after, Alex Pulowski plucked me for the Tuesday night show, and I've been unbelievably b- blessed to. To have opportunities there ever since i have a very full week of, of yeah. <laughs> wrestling oh. content and i love every minute of it and that there's i'm very fortunate and that i don't think there's anywhere else i would rather be doing it and that to have that be my first like professional experience out of the gate i just i feel so blessed by that that's very cool to hear and something that without talking about myself i do agree with because fightful has been every time i've had interactions even with your good self on Twitter or any of the other Fightful crew. I feel very lucky. But getting back to your good self, when Jeremy wants to vacate the Friday show and he's on about bringing your good self on, how does that make you feel when you're like, is it like rabbit in the headlights moment or is it like, yes, I can do this, let's do this sort of thing? You know, a little bit of both. A little bit of both because... um... It was so unexpected and kind of like as we were talking about, like I didn't have intentions of doing this. Fightful was not uh, a place I was trying to work at. I I wasn't um, wasn't writing anything. I was just doing this podcast where I was goofing off with my friends. But I felt confident in my abilities. And I, um, from the prediction show, had just known at that point it was Sean and I. I've, I've mostly taken over the hosting role on, on Fridays now, but uh he just made me feel so comfortable and he kept it so fun and light on the prediction show that um i i was anxious about it but i knew that like it was just for the excitement about it because there was Mm. it's such a safe environment there's moderators the the community there is incredibly supportive and sean just made it so much darn fun to to host alongside him that uh my hesitations were non-existent i was just like oh this is cool and nerve-wracking i can't believe thousands of people are tuning in to hear me talk about wrestling Mm. normally it's just me talking to my dog at that point right so (laughs) yeah yeah that is a very weird thing so how you talked about thousands of people uh before we get into chemistry with your co-host you talked about thousands of people maybe tuning in to watch so how did that change like your social media life or like your personal life when you started to be recognized for your work more in the wrestling media um trying to think of how to phrase this i don't i don't think i at any point i was ever careless with things that i would be saying but I oh think no now, that's not what i'm saying Let me no no, no but i i think i've been more intentional like i, hmm. I don't think i was ever um and not in a way that I was saying things like like poorly or out of turn or anything like that. But now I, I think I'm a little bit more aware of me saying what I really want to say in things like, um, you know, the, the hardest days, the hardest days are always cuts like those days suck. And um, I never want to come across as um, being negative on an entire company or anything like yeah. that. But I what I always try to emphasize is what the plight of a wrestler is in that situation. Right. And how difficult that is and how you've worked for something your whole life to have it ripped away. And and like, I always, I always try to lead into positivity and empathy, even on a show called sour graps where we are like delightfully hyper critical. I think, Um, you know, it's never, never, never at the talent. It's always at the creative. Um, 
And I, I think just recognizing that there are people who are giving crap what I have to say, I um, try to be a little bit more intentional with, with the way I say things. Mm, I know exactly what you mean there. So obviously you also talked about your great co-hosts like Alex, other Alex, yeah. and Reg, <laughs> and I'm going to throw Kyle in there because I really enjoyed your podcast with him. Oh, thank you. At time what a of recording. Oh. At time of recording. This week, Kyle was a great guy. Like, big love to the him best. if he ends up watching this. But how do you build? How did it? How long did it take for you and Alex to build Alex Palowski to build your chemistry for sour grabs, Do you think? We'll My with. goodness. Um. So, so the fun for me, including my Wednesday night co-host too, um, and Mark Order. Uh, every stream I do feels so different. Um behind the paywall and on the main channel feel different behind, um, you know, certain products, recovering certain products compared to other products feels different. ROH reviews feel opposite end of the spectrum to, um, you know, WWE raw reviews or whatever. Like it's, it's a very different with all those with Alex. It's just so like unbelievably unique and special in, in the way that that show has organically devolved into madness in the most delightful way. So um, he and I, I, I think I was at Fightful two weeks before he was like, I, I want to test out this gal as a co-host because he was somehow doing these shows alone. And I watched them because I was like, I loved what he was doing. I felt like he was a, a little bit of like the Lewis Black of um, pro wrestling analysis, mm. but he offered so many insights into alternatives that he would recommend when he was critical about stuff or other ways to tell stories and explore them. Um, So walking into that, I was like, I don't want to say intimidated because it was never anything with him, but it's such a specific flavor of show. And when he's got his own brand, I suppose, you don't want to feel like you're stepping on his toes. Exactly. I was like, in that way, it was more being invited into it because it didn't feel just like a review show. It felt like it had a, a more specific um, Format. tone to it. Yeah, exactly. So walking in there, um, I think it was probably about a month in, maybe even sooner. Um, yeah, you know, we were covering the beginning of the 2.0 era, which was the end of the black and gold era. And my first episode, I had come on with like a, a funeral garb for the NXT era. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. <laughs> it was so silly and fun and he leaned into it so hard. And then, um, you know, with as wacky as 2.0 can be of a product, whether you like it or not, um, you know, it, it just with as skilled as he is with his voiceover work and um, like all the, the songs that we started having, like it just felt like we were being so nitpicking on the wrestling but having so much fun doing it 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 really probably felt like in in the first month to six weeks and i could just give him all the credit in the world for that because it's um he was going alone for a long time and then you're inviting someone else in like he just created such a, a warm and wonderful environment and um made it really really easy and it's such a breeze to just sit there every tuesday with that guy and co-steer the ship like it, mm. it makes it so much fun <laughs> you talked about the uh, alex bringing you in uh, mm-hmm. to do the show so how does it feel to now be the person because alex cardoza told me a great story during our interview of the fact that you vouched for him when it came to bringing him on to fight for is what he told me so how does it now feel to be on the opposite end of that spectrum which you were with alex palowski and now being someone that is bringing in co-hosts, for example. That was very wordy. I do apologize. No, no, it's all good. It's What's so funny about it was I had no idea that's what I was doing. I, I did not realize at the time that Sean was vacating uh, the throne and, and passing it over to me, essentially. It's still his darn network. He can come back whenever he wants, and he yeah. still comes back on for, for breaking shows. But um, I had met Alex... We had followed each other on Twitter and then I found out he lived in New Jersey. And so I met up with him in person and I I just loved his energy about things. He was intelligent, but he he takes 
his analysis seriously, but not himself too seriously, which is always the the tone that I'm looking for spot. with someone. Exactly, exactly. And I I thought I was just bringing him in for a week or two, and then gradually Sean started to call out more and more, and then mm-hmm. eventually. Sean was uh, on one point where I think it was the three of us were on. Sean was like, hey, I want you to act like you're hosting the the show. Like you just you drive the ship, even though I'm here. And I was like, I see what's going on here. Sean's getting himself off Friday night. Which <laughs> felt um Which more power to him, I said. Yeah, well, and and honestly felt I, I felt so um happy that he trusted me enough to to do that. Like to me, that felt like um a, a really big moment for me because it it meant he trusted me to complete the process of setting up a broadcast, recording it and pulling it down. And and the idea that I can give that man even a couple hours off in his week is something that is um, maybe my biggest contribution to, <laughs> to Fightful overall. But bringing Alex in was, was a no-brainer with his um, disposition and we have so much fun. I just truly didn't know that that's what I was doing, but I'm so glad I did it because he's such a, a wonderful perspective. I love that um, he's a, a veteran. I love that he's Hispanic and um, views things through a very different lens than I ever could just based on who we are, right? So um very, very glad that I accidentally welcomed him to the fold because he's just just a wonderful, wonderful presence to have along with us. That's very cool to hear. But what about adding the third man to your trio, which is Robert <laughs> D. Felice? How does that come about? And like, how do you sort of become the Friday Night Trio? Oh my gosh. So Robert D. Felice is just the warmest, most inviting um, person. He He's so special. And uh, even though he's not in regular rotation, whenever there's like... Of course like, he's not. I do uh, it though, no, 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 it's okay. I just, he's always the first person I call upon when I can't because he's just so much fun to to sit in with. He's completely different than anybody else on, on the channel. And um, that I think he, he has a really great balance of keeping an open mind and, and heart to what's on screen, but also bringing up about a lot of incredible, like in, intelligent analysis into that. Um, Pulaski and I are obviously crazy and and nitpicking every little thing. And Alex Cardoza and I are a little bit more, I think, kind of up the middle with things. But Robert has like this looks for the positive, but isn't blinded by um, when things are are off off base. And it's it makes him such a delight to be on screen with and a phenomenal writer, too. Mm. I don't want to say I agree, but he's he's a very <laughs> nice guy, mate, and I've yeah. got nothing but love for Rob. So, obviously, we talked about... We, actually, we didn't talk about Rich. so how does that come about that you start <laughs> doing the Friday night... Uh, the Ring of Honor shows with Rich? So this was... Uh, actually, like, it's, it sounds a little corny because we're talking about wrestling podcasts. Nothing is that serious. But one really cool moment in my career so far in this is... Um, there was requests from other people for me and Reg to do an ROH post show together because we're so in love with the brand. And to see the it get reverse engineered to where people were requesting it in chats and stuff was like such a, a breathtaking moment for me because um, I'm, a, I'm on this channel a lot already. So the fact that people want to see me more means a lot to me. Mm. And Reg is just such like a... a like such a, a wonderful personality and also like also in love with ROH in the same way that I am. So um an absolute party to do a show with. And just, it feels like with ROH, it's something that I'm rooting for, that he's rooting for. Most of the people that are tuning in are rooting for, like this feels more than most brands kind of free of any sort of tribalism or back and forth because they're not like fully competing with anyone, right? They're kind of just trying to find yeah. their their way and they have such a rich history that's contributed so much uh, to the present wrestling landscape everywhere. So um, Reg being a steward of the brand and also just being like, 
I would say he's like, I, I use this phrase sometimes, he's like party insurance. Like if you were having a party and you were like, I don't know if it's going to go well, you invite Reg because then you know it's going to be like, it's going to be so much fun with mm. that guy. <laughs> like that's what it feels like to host for Reg. And I'm also in the hosting role and not the co-hosting role with him. So it, it makes it so easy to kind of run down the card, give my thoughts, but then throw it over to him because he um he's just such an attention grabber and also just really, really valuable in the way that he views things. Mm. You talked about there uh, the two different sides of the role, whether it be the hosting or the co-hosting role. So wh- if I said to you, look, Kate, you've got to pick one side, which side would you pick? Would you rather be the co-host or the actual host? Hosting. Show? Hosting. It, now, it's tricky because with Alex Pulaski, I would sign up to co-host that uh, any day of the week. Any day of the week, any time you name it. Um, because co-hosting with him is just the the easiest, most fun experience in what we do. But dollars to donuts, I uh, am a little bit of a control freak. <laughs> so that's all it is. Is it's I, I really truly love both, and there are plenty of weeks where I'm thankful to be co-hosting because it is less responsibility. But knowing that, like, I'm the one responsible for the time limit, I'm the one responsible for reading the chats, like, I get a tremendous amount of peace in that. And actually, what was funny was last time Sean was on and I was co-hosting Fridays, I was, like, a little bit off because instinctually I was starting to go to, like, look at chats and, yeah, just, just, uh, like, the muscle memory of it was was kind of kicked in. Um, So I, I prefer to host, but... I, I don't know if there's anything more fun in this world than than co-hosting on Tuesdays with mm-hmm. Alex, but overall role-wise, I, I prefer to host. Mm-hmm. So if I said to you, look, you can only pick one of the shows you do a week, and Sean says to you, look, you've got to get rid of one. You've got to get rid of all of them, uh, one of uh, most of them, but you can pick one. Which co-host are you working with and what show is it? Oh God, that hurts. That you hurts hate me my... so much right now. I do, I do, because I feel like Sorry. I would just quit because I couldn't make the decision. Um, you know, it's so funny because Tuesdays might be the most fun I have, but it's my least favorite product. Mm. Uh, <laughs> right, right now. Um, and Fridays are like a little bit more up the middle, but usually the chat is really active and a lot of fun. But, um. Man, that's tough. Like, I think I'm just so in love with ROH and it feels like I'm making the biggest difference with ROH that that's probably the one I would want to keep because it's my my favorite product. And um, I feel like they're probably most actively. I think I think the talent that works there has the most to gain by us reviewing what's happening there. So that's probably the way I would go. But you are a hundred percent asking me to kill all my darlings because I I feel like every day is a a very different experience and a super fun one. <laughs> this is this is one clip. This is one thing that I will say, guys. Make sure you watch the entire concept of that part of the interview. Don't just watch the clip on social media. <laughs> yeah, please. please, please don't please. take it out of context. <laughs> Kate loves everyone she works with, and yeah. there's no. Is that correct? Oh my gosh. I, I feel so unbelievably fortunate to love everybody that I work with. And I don't just mean other people that I host with on screen, like the entire writing staff, um, Gisberto, who does uh, our thumbnails for us. Our moderator, Luis, is just one of my favorite people in the world. Kyler, that does our social media. Like the team from front to back is, is a situation where... Um, it's more rare than it should, but I just have so much love and respect for everybody on the team because we're all just trying to have fun and work hard. Mm. Um, and I, I always say that I I love doing this. This was never something I was seeking out to do. It's not more important for me to work with people that I don't like and respect than it is to be in wrestling media. It's so much more important to me to feel like I'm working with great people than it is to talk about wrestling. Because I could go talk about wrestling wherever I want. So <laughs> that's the beauty exactly of technology, right? So I, uh, I, I'm I, very, very fortunate and that it's a, a group of people from front to back that I'm I'm so happy to be working with. That's very cool. So obviously we talked about who you currently work with and things like that. But if we throw your bucket list out there, who is someone you want to do a show with, whether it be on Fightful, just in wrestling media in general, who is someone you're like, if the universe worked out, it'd be very cool to do a show with them. 
Oh my gosh. Like on a consistent basis or a one-timer? The dealer's choice on that one. Oh, okay. Um, I have had so much fun and it's funny cause we're on the same network and she's had me on her channel a couple of times, but we consistently working with Denise Salcedo sounds like a really, really fun idea. Mm. I would also throw, um, Andrew Zarian into that mix. I just love Ooh. that that guy's disposition so much. Uh, I got to do Wrestling Observer Live with him, and he. Oh wow! Um, yeah, that was that was a really big moment for me because I, before I was ever podcasting, uh, I don't know if I've told this story like on a, a podcast before, but I, yeah, yeah, a little, little scoopsky. I don't know if I've mentioned this uh, on on air, but I the first. The first Jericho cruise I went on, which was the second Jericho cruise, um, I loved, my, one of my favorite parts of it was the live recordings of podcasts that they did there. And I, I wasn't expecting that, but Meltzer had done these two kind of like town halls. And I asked a couple of questions and someone who I had met on that cruise that I have seen a couple of times since, um, said you know i remember you asking those questions that was before you ever had a podcast ever like thought about media and he was i won't say who but he was like there was a talent that was like sitting off to the side and saw you ask those questions and was like those are some good questions that that girl just asked and uh and that just meant the world to me and he was like and now look where you are and that was a really really special moment but the Meltzer being you know i I know people have a lot of thoughts or whatever now, but like he is the first and most established wrestling media news source for the longest time with years and years running. And it always I, to this day blows my mind that in that town hall, he got asked about specific new Japan matches from the eighties and also incredibly general questions about the wrestling landscape and the way he answered all of them with just this fountain of knowledge and expertise. I have so much respect for that. It, it absolutely blows my mind. So getting to do wrestling observer was like a, a very full circle moment for me in that regard. That's very cool. So one thing that's been a constant of this conversation is like, how you never expected to do wrestling media and things like that. So my question for you is, do you view your experience and working in wrestling media so far as success? You know, I do because um, I, I think, uh, not to sound braggadocious in any way, but the feedback I get from other people is is what makes that real uh i've done commentary at a couple of indie shows and i had someone come up to me after a show and say like hey we need you like we need <laughs> we need women in this space we need people with your perspective we need advocates um and that just like almost took my breath away because when you hear things like that or probably the moments that are bigger than anything you could say on a wrestling podcast when someone says to you Hey, I'm going through a really, really hard time, and these podcasts make it a little bit easier for a couple hours a week. That supersedes any wrestling insight, take analysis that I could ever have. So, to me, the value is in so much more than talking about wrestling and the the moments where you're providing people with um, a little bit more ease in their day or or something like that. Mm, I know exactly what you mean there. But if this was all to end tomorrow like Fightful or whatever, your wrestling media side, what would you want your legacy in wrestling media to be? Um, I think if this were to all end tomorrow, what I would want people to kind of take away from it is that exploring any art form, including wrestling, um, is can be some of the most rewarding and and wonderful things you can do to listen to other people's thoughts and opinions on it but um to keep an open mind and and just know that wrestling is for everyone like i think it's so important to explore and view things and see how other people view forms of storytelling because at the end of the day that's where human connection ends but wrestling is for everyone it's subjective enjoy it um but yeah, I, I would say if if anybody takes anything away from it, it's be exploratory with with wrestling and every other art form because it's incredibly rewarding and you'll you'll learn so much that you never even knew in some ways about yourself. <laughs> That's really cool. But we've we've done this all around the houses, and I should have done this during the podcast. 
inside and i do apologize for that but what is like your routine when you know you're going to be on a podcast for example do you have to get into a headspace do you do anything to get into a headspace (laughs) except oh my goodness yes i uh i have i have anxiety and um it it goes up and down and so to manage it when i'm having trouble if i feel panic attacks coming on or anything like that i have a pretty extensive routine i always say that like Usually the main event time of a podcast, people would think I was getting ready to, or before a podcast, I people would think I was getting ready to go in it because I'm usually, um, I do breathing exercises that are, I learned from when I took vocal lessons singing. Uh, I usually light a candle and I kind of just like take a few minutes to, to zone in. Mm. Um, the best way for me to control any sort of anxiety is preparation, 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 making sure that my notes are clean, making sure that everything's covered, making sure I have access to all the technology I need to, making sure that our wonderful moderator, Luis, who takes care of the Super Chat doc I have access to, um, that makes me feel like I could run on autopilot so that I can do my job the best. But beforehand, it is always like a an anxiety candle is, is, is lit and I do breathing exercises and just, and just kind of get locked in a little bit. Mm. I understand what you're saying completely because I have a very similar routine myself about the technology and stuff but what about to come out of the podcasting zone afterwards do you do anything? It takes me a long time to key down unfortunately which is tough on nights like last night because um i we were done at like two in the morning and i just (laughs) couldn't couldn't knock out i couldn't fall asleep which is rough but uh usually my dog has to go out so i'll take her out but from the production side uh the client that we use i pull the audio down and i upload it onto the client that distributes all of the the audio for fightful i'll also double check on our um fightful youtube account that there's just little things that are set up the, that the video is set to monetize, that it's added to the appropriate playlists of where those belong on the channel, um, things like that. Usually I'll, I'll try to loop back around with the, the co-host if it's someone that's newer, um, just to make sure that they had a, a positive experience, things like that. But as, as far as post-production goes, it's usually uploading the audio and taking it down um, and making sure that everything is, is, set up clean on YouTube. And I'll usually go back to just to do a check of my internet is notoriously horrific. Um, so it's just, just so go, ba- go back. It is, it is knock on wood. Um, but I, I always go back to also just kind of just, just scroll through the, the actual YouTube link to make sure there was nothing that like dropped out or anything like that. I know exactly what you mean, but as we look at wrapping this up, okay, cause I do want to be respectful of your time. Sure. We're going to do a segment that I call generic questions. Those yeah. of you who have seen my interviews before, when I swear ask my guests, the wrestling questions they might get asked on social media, such as Kate's favorite match, favorite pay per view, favorite wrestling wrestlers entrance for you, favorite tag team, and favorite wrestler. So you guys will have a place to know the answer to these questions, and you'll never have to ask her again. So, what's your favorite <laughs> match of all time? Oh man! So favorite versus best are two different questions for me. Mm. Um. My favorite match of all time is is probably CM Punk John Cena Money in the Bank 2011 because as someone who started watching in 09 that was just the coolest experience for me but it's if I go watch Bret and Owen at SummerSlam that's my favorite match that day if I watch Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at Mania that's my favorite match that day who I I mentioned um Eddie and Ray at Halloween Havoc I mean god is there any match that makes you feel that way so if I had to pick, I would say that one because it's it's one of the most fundamental to me as a wrestling fan. But um, a lot of times, what if one, I'm just active, to clarify, sorry, John Cena and CM Punk at Money ah, in the Bank okay, 2011. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What about your favorite overall pay per view card? As in, like, uh, for example, WrestleMania 26. Ah. Uh... It it doesn't get much better from the viewing experience for me than All Out of last year. Um, the, 2022? Or I'm sorry, 2021, where we had Cole and Danielson debuting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 
we'll talk about it shortly because I know it's on your your questions. But um, CM Punk was so fundamental in in my fandom of wrestling that him actually coming back to wrestle in the ring when you had those debuts to close it. Um, absolutely, absolutely, some of the my favorite my favorite viewing experience it is that is the one thing about having watched later is that i feel like the watching in real time piece of it affects what is my favorite versus what i could like kind of consider best in that regard um and wrestlemania 30 gives it a run for its money too i would say for sure for sure fair enough what about your favorite wrestler's entrance theme of all time it's so hard um because i i love music and so i like that changes it changes so much i love the tmdk theme right now in new japan the um young punks by mass lines is so much fun to hear an entrance to stone cold i think has to be the mo- most iconic in that way but i i think dollars to donuts i gotta go either it's gotta be shinsuke i think for me it's just Every iteration of who he's been as a character when they brought it back to Japan and he was fighting Muda, it just, oh, it's so perfect. It's so on the nose and um, such a big part of the presentation. Kevin Owens is a close runner up, though, too. I'd Hmm. love that. (laughs) What about your favorite tag team? Favorite tag team is FTR. I think Hmm. um, certainly right now, and I I feel like in general, again, like um, watching a team build greatness in real time. I also love going back and watching anything Art and Tully. I like watching anything Heart Foundation as well. Um, but I, I think FTR is, uh, like I said, in ring is like my thing. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> FTR is is where I break on that. And then finally, as we wrap up the genetic question segment, sure. you've alluded to it, but who is your favorite <laughs> wrestler? So CM Punk is is for uh, my favorite for what he's he's done for me as a fan but my the rest of my mount rushmore has daniel said and stone cold and bret hart on it so mm. since i tipped my hand early i thought i would give you some of those alternatives that's very <laughs> cool but as we wrap this up kate the question i end all my interviews on is with youtube with podcasting with social media in general i i believe that us content creators are going to live forever in some sort of very strange way so what is one piece of content you want to be remembered for and one that you're like, if the powers that be could forget about this, I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, one piece of content that I would like to be remembered for. I would say mm, there's kind of two. I went on a pretty epic rant on WrestleMania night two last year about the New Day getting shafted and Vince McMahon having a match and, and undressing. So that that one is up there on the ramp perspective as far as things that have added value. Is that a to Fightful this. show, yeah? It was. It was a Fightful Select Night 2 WrestleMania review. So we were completely unhinged because it was very late and we had already done five reviews that weekend. Hey, um, hey, hey. Yeah, <laughs> this weekend was, was actually more, believe it or not, <laughs> than Mania. Um, but I also was... When there were mass cuts in WWE, I kind of alluded to it before, but I... I think some people started to realize like the the weight wrestlers carry with them and that especially NXT cuts because I have such a like I understand that they're in developmental and there were some people that messaged me after I kind of said like I I don't think people get like how hard this is it's like you everybody's working injured all the time and you establish this character on the indies and then they change it when you get to NXT and you try to adapt to what they do and then they cut you or they move you up and that doesn't translate like how mentally, emotionally, and physically taxing it can be. I had some people message me after that and say, like, man, it really opened my eyes to, like, what a wrestler, just an average wrestler, goes through. And to me, that was one of the more valuable things. Something that we could forget about? I'm trying to think. The, what is the most embarrassing thing that I've said? <laughs> <laughs> so many! Um, no, I, uh, that's a good question. I think there was, there was an episode of the, the Mark Order podcast that I could probably get rid of where I was, uh, not sober. We could probably get that one out of here. <laughs> Fair, Fair <laughs> that enough. One out of here. We'll get the drunk episode out. <laughs> Fair enough. So as we wrap this up, Kate, obviously I want to say thank you for coming on. Thank you for your time. This has been an amazing conversation. 
where can the good people find you and your content as we wrap this up? Well, I'll say uh, thank you so much for um, having a, a conversation that's a little bit different and, and focuses on the actual content creation piece of it and having such a wonderful conversation with a lot of my peers in the space, both at Pipeful and beyond. Um, but you can find me at Miss Kate Fabe on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on Fightful Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays uh, on Fightful or Fightful Select. One of those two. I'm always there. And then Wednesdays at the Mark Order Podcast at Mark Order Pod. It's well worth doing, guys. One of the best content creators I feel in this space. But Thank one you. of the nicest as well. So if you guys Thank like you this so video, much. make sure you like, share, and subscribe to Tom Talk Trash on YouTube. And follow me on Twitter, at TomTalkTrash. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye now.